God can do something. All right, we're getting there. This is the story of Joseph, and Joseph came from a huge family. He had 11 brothers. Could you imagine? 11 brothers, and while they were all living at home together, Joseph gets a gift from his dad, and the gift that he gets causes a lot of trouble. A gift causes trouble. Doesn't usually happen, right? Sometimes, maybe. Israel, that's the dad. Here we go. Genesis chapter 37. Now Israel, he's the dad, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. And when his brothers saw that his father loved him more than any, any of them, they hated him and they could not speak a kind word to him. So not good, right? Could you imagine how your 11 brothers, well, just imagine having 11 brothers, but could you imagine how your 11 brothers would feel if one of the adults in your home took you to the mall and bought you all of the cool clothes, but they just brought all the cool clothes for you? Well, his brothers, they were jealous, and they hated him, and they got worse. We're going to continue in Genesis chapter 37, verse 5. Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered round mine and bowed down to it. Right? And his brother said to him, uh, do you intend to reign over us? Are you actually going to rule us? And they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said about it. So basically, Joseph was saying this. Hey, guys, guess what? In life, I'm the boss of you. So first, the brothers get jealous. Then they get angry. And finally, the brothers, they come up with this evil plan. They trap him. They tear his robe. And they sell him to slave traders. Not good. And then after they, he gets sold to the slave traders, he's sold by the slave traders to a very important man named Potiphar. Can everybody say Potiphar? Potiphar. Yeah, that's kind of a weird name, right? It's not like Joe, Mike, Dan, or Steve. We got Potiphar. Okay. So anyway, could it get any worse for Joseph? Well, we're going to find out. But here's what we need to remember, right? We need to go back to our little team meeting up here, guys. When your life seems to be getting worse, God can do something good. good. And God did do something good. He did. Joseph was taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, the Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, captain of the guard, bought him. He bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. And when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. And Potiphar put him in charge of his household and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So even though Joseph was treated horribly by his brothers, even though he almost died, even though he was sold into slavery... And even though his life seemed to be getting worse, God did something good. And the same is true for us. Even when your life seems to be getting worse, God can do something good. So for the meantime, Joseph is safe. He's liked. He's got a pretty good job, right? God's doing something good. And time goes on. And time will go on in our lives. But then... Well, here's what you need to know about Joseph. He was a nice guy. He was a good-looking guy. He was a good worker. Joseph was a likable guy. He was such a likable guy that Potiphar's wife started to take notice of Joseph. Now, without getting into all the details of that, This woman, Potiphar's wife, tempted him to do something that was not good. Not good. Have you ever been tempted to do something 
that was not good, that if you actually did it, things would get really, really worse for you? Well, Joseph, he didn't do it. He didn't sin. He didn't follow her into sin. And that's a good thing because God in that moment helped Joseph to, to make a good choice. Isn't that cool when God helps us to make a good choice? We're thankful for that. But when Potiphar's wife realized that she couldn't take Joseph with her into sin, she starts telling lies about him. Not good. She told him this story, that Hebrew slave, you brought us, came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and he ran out of the house. And when his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison. Not good. Took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. So even though, even though Joseph got tricked and was tempted to do this really bad thing, even though someone was telling lies about him, and even though he gets thrown into jail, what did God do? God did something. Good. He did something good. And the same is true for us. When our lives seem to be getting worse, God can do something good. So what did God do? Let's take a look. The story goes on. 13 chapters, by the way. <laughs> While Joseph was there in prison... The Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for everything that was done there. The warden paid, the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So again and again and again in Joseph's life, when things seem to be getting worse, God just keeps doing something good. God blesses him. He blesses his reputation. He blesses his relationships. And I think if Joseph were here, he would be saying to us, hey, well, you know, when your life seems to be getting worse, God can do something good. Isn't that cool? Okay. And the story goes on. And more time passes, and Joseph is imprisoned, and one day, this very unique opportunity comes for Joseph. I'll tell you what, I think as followers of Jesus, we need to be looking out for those moments and those days when God seems to be up to something. Here's what happens. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men... Two men, not Joseph, two more guys. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were being held in the prison had a dream. So two guys that are in prison with Joseph, they have a dream the same night, and each dream had a different meaning of its own. Joseph came to them in the morning, and he saw that they were dejected. He saw that they were not well. So he asks Pharaoh's officials who are, officials who are in custody with him in his master's house, he says, why do you, why do you look so sad today? Why so sad? Why so sad? We both had dreams, but there's no one to interpret them, they said. So basically, these two guys, they're freaking out about their dreams. They're upset. They're confused. I'll tell you what, you're going to have friends in your school, and you're going to show up to school one day, and you're going to notice that something's not okay with them. And you're going to think, what's wrong? What happened? What's the matter with you? Right? Your friends in school, maybe uh, members of our family, maybe neighbors that we have. They're freaking out. They're upset. They're confused. But here's what we need to remember. Here's our, second, here's our second point. We talked about this one, too. Second point. When someone we care about is in trouble, God can do something good. Right? And sometimes, here's the thing. Sometimes God will use us to do something good for someone else. And I think if we ever notice that God has allowed our path to, to meet up with somebody, whether it's in school, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your neighborhood, wherever you go, 
If we notice that someone else is in trouble, I think it's an opportunity for us to just stop and to think, God, what do you want to do right now for this person? God, do you want to do something good for them? So we can pray about that. First thing we do is pray, God, do something good for this person. But I also think we should pay attention because we might have the gifts, the abilities, the resources, the time, or the capacity to be used by God to do something good. And we can jump right in. And God can do something good through us. And that's what Joseph does. Joseph does something good for the cupbearer and the breaker who are in trouble. And he does something good because God allows it and God enables him. Here's what happens. Joseph says to them, don't interpretations belong to God. Tell me, tell me your dreams. Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me. And on the vine were three branches. And as soon as it budded, it blossomed. And its clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took the grapes. And I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup. And that was in his hand. <sighs> And Joseph says, this is what it means. This is what it means. The three branches are three days. And within three days, Pharaoh will lift, you, lift up your head and restore you to your position. You're getting out of prison, is what he's saying. And you're going to put Pharaoh's cup in his hand just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. That's good news for that guy, Right? So Joseph steps into a moment of chaos, a moment of confusion, a moment of trouble. And think about that guy. When he heard the, the interpretation, of him, oh, he's at peace, right? But then Joseph asks him to do something. He says, uh, but when all goes well with you, remember me? <laughs> remember me? And show me kindness. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I've done nothing. I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. When someone we care about is in trouble, God can do something good. God gave Joseph, God gave Joseph a special gift to help these guys understand what was happening in their dreams. And then Joseph became known in the prison and eventually out of the prison. He became known as a very talented, I'll just call it a dream teacher, okay? Never heard that phrase before. We're just going to use it today. A dream teacher. And what Joseph asks, he's like, you know, help get me out of here. And it actually happens because these guys will mention him to Pharaoh and it will get him out of prison. So whenever someone's in trouble, whenever we notice that somebody else is in trouble, we can ask God to do something good. We can pray about it. And we could ask God if there's something that we can do. And wouldn't it be cool, wouldn't it be cool if everybody in here, young people, older people, all people in here became known. What if we became known as people, if we had a reputation as people who had gifts given by God and that we were good at helping? That'd be cool. When someone we care about is in trouble, God can do something good. And two years later, only took two years, two years later, Joseph's reputation as a helper and a dream teacher actually gets him out of jail. And it gets him out of jail because Pharaoh had a bad dream, a troubling dream. And one of the men that Joseph helped told Pharaoh, hey, there's this guy who's a really good dream teacher. He can help you out. And so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. No one can interpret it. But I've heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. I can't do it, Joseph said to Pharaoh. But God, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. I love that. I love how he's willing to step in. But before he steps in, he's like, yeah, but this is all about God, by the way. Right? Let's get, let's get that straight. So Pharaoh's in trouble, right? Somebody else is in trouble, and what's God going to do? God's going to do something good. There we go. So Joseph helps him understand his dream, but here's the deal. The dream that Pharaoh had 
was about a horrible, horrible tragedy that was going to happen. So tragedies are always horrible. But if you know about it before it happens, you can do something about it. You can prepare for it. So here was the tragedy. The tragedy was that there was going to be a famine, okay? Not a word young people hear about or talk about every day. But listen, a famine means that all of the food was going to run out. And the food was going to run out for seven years. Sometimes I'm not okay if food runs out for seven minutes, okay? <laughs> we, the food was going to run out for seven years. So what Joseph does for Pharaoh and really for the world is he warns them about the famine before it happens so that they could figure out what to do. And not only does Joseph give the warning through God's interpretation of the dream, he also gives Pharaoh the 14-year management plan to handle this. And here was the plan. Save food for seven years, and for seven years there would be food to eat. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his officials, and so Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom, the, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Pharaoh says to Joseph, since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one so discerning and as wise as you. You will be in charge of my palace, and all of my people are to submit to your orders only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So here's our second, our second big idea once again. When, when someone we care about is in trouble, God can do something good, right? God did so much in this situation. He did so much. He saved Joseph from prison. He let the Pharaoh know that trouble was coming. He used Joseph to give Pharaoh the really good 14-year how to deal with the tragedy plan. And he lifts Joseph from prisoner, literally from prisoner to prince. It's amazing. And God saves thousands and thousands and thousands of people from dying through Joseph, through Pharaoh, through the nation of Egypt. We need to be on the lookout for people in trouble. Because God may use us to do something good just like Joseph was used by God to help Egypt. When someone we care about is in trouble, God can do something good. Okay, last part of the story. Here's how we're gonna finish today, ready? So Egypt and Joseph, they have the 14 year plan to save the world, okay? And so what happens? The whole world comes to Egypt to buy food, to buy grain. So think about this. If the whole world is coming to Egypt to buy food, to survive the famine, who else is coming to Egypt and to Joseph to buy food, to survive the famine? Well, think about it. Remember uh, the 11 brothers at the beginning of the story? How do you think their tummies are doing? Not good. Right? Joseph's evil brothers also need food. Let's find out what's been going on with them, or what's going on with them at this point in the story. Jacob learns that there is no grain, there is grain in Egypt. Okay, so Jacob, that's the dad of all the brothers, learns that there was grain in Egypt. And he says to his sons, why do you just keep looking at each other? <laughs> that's kind of funny. Why are you sleep looking at each other? I heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down and buy some for us so that we may not, so that we may live and not die. So 10 of Joseph's brothers went to go buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. Well, makes sense, right? We know the story. So Israel's sons were among those who went to buy grain because there was also a famine in the land of Canaan. There was, there was famine everywhere. 
Joseph was the governor of the land, and he was the person who sold the grain to the people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down, they bowed down to him. Ah, uh, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from? <laughs> Where do you come from? From the land of Canaan to buy food. And although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Can you imagine? This is the moment. I mean... Isn't it interesting? We could spend our whole lives remembering things that happened back then, right? And in this moment, they're face to face. What would you do? What would you do if these guys showed up? The brothers that trapped you and tore your coat and sold you into slavery. And all of a sudden, they're... They're at your door saying, can you help us? So what happens next in the story is kind of difficult to understand. Instead of telling the brothers right away that he was Joseph and about everything that had happened and everything he had learned and everything that was going on, he sends, he sends them away. And I can't imagine what he must have been feeling, right? He must have been feeling all of the things you could feel. Pain, joy, sorrow, regret, bitterness, confusion, anger, joy, sorrow, regret, right? He's feeling all these things. It's an, it, it seemingly, it looks like an impossible situation. And I'm sure that there are situations in your life where you think about it and it's like, I, I don't even, it's impossible. But here's what's true. When it seems really impossible, God can do something Good, you guys still with me? Yeah. Almost done. So eventually the brothers, they come back. And I think what was happening in this time is God was working it out, working it out like he does, working it out in Joseph so that he could be in a place where he could understand, where he could forgive, where he could kind of get God's perspective and he, I think God brings him to a place where he can actually explain, he can explain it. You know why I think God brought him to a place where he could explain it? Because he explains it to his brothers. Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Come close to me. I'm your brother. I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold in Egypt. And now don't be distressed. Don't be distressed. Don't be angry with yourselves for... for selling me here because it was to save lives. It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there's been famine in the land and for the next five, there's gonna be no plowing and no reaping. But God, but God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives, to save your lives by a great deliverance. When it seems impossible, God can do something good. His brothers, they can't believe it. They don't quite know if this is real or not. It's so hard to believe for them that for years they kind of question it. Genesis chapter 50, which is a little bit down the line, the brothers say this. Uh, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back? for all the wrongs we did to him. But these brothers, they don't need to worry about it. They don't need to worry because God did something good. The forgiveness was complete. The relationship was restored. And when our lives feel overwhelming, we need to remember that when it seems impossible, God can do something good. And this was an impossible situation. And here's how we know Here's how we know we're not putting words in Joseph's mouth here, okay? Here's how we know that Joseph, Joseph also thought that God could do something good. We know that Joseph, we know that Joseph feels this way because he says it. He says it. Joseph says to them, don't be afraid. 
am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for? God intended it for? For good, right? To accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and for your children. And he reassured them. He reassured them. He reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. Here's what's true. Young people, medium-aged people, old people, all people. Here's what's true. If you haven't yet, you are going to face an impossible situation. And it's going to feel like there's no way out. It's one of the awkward promises of scripture. In this world, you will face trouble. Trouble's coming. But in the middle of that chaos and that trouble, feeling like it's totally impossible, there may come a time when God is ready to move to help you to forgive, to open your eyes to what God is doing. And when God moves, he can bring all of it. He can bring healing, understanding, and a new situation. And it can, it's beyond anything we could get our heads around at any given moment. God is perfect and how much healing and how much restoration he brings, he knows what he's doing, his timing is perfect, whether it's big or small, fast or slow. You can trust everything to God, just like Joseph, because no matter what happens to you or to anyone else or how impossible it seems, God can do something good. Will you say that with me? God can do something good. Very nice, well done. All right, pastor's challenge, number one. Read the story of Joseph this week, okay? The story of Joseph is like 13 chapters. We did it in like 2237. We're not trying for PRs here, but that'd be, that'd be a PR, okay? <laughs> 13 chapters, so much more. There's so much more. I remember the first time I read the story of Joseph because when you see, when you see what's happening in those 13 chapters, it's kind of hard to forget. It's amazing. Read the story of Joseph this week, number one. Number two, and this may be for like the drive home today. Share a story with someone who will listen a time in your life when, you're, when your life seemed to be getting worse and God did something good. Or when someone you cared about was in trouble and God did something good. Or when it seemed impossible and God did something good. If there is a story that is coming to mind Pastor's challenge, share it with someone who will listen. Parents, if, if you've got young people and they're willing to listen, uh, take this moment. Let them see your life and affirm this as true for them by telling a real story of something that, that you've been through where God did something good. Last challenge, it's a little more abstract and futuristic-ish. Um, think about ways that you can prepare for trouble. Because if the promise of scripture is, in this world you will face trouble, think about some ways you can prepare for it so that you're strong and fortified and okay and have some perspective when trouble comes. Okay. Thanks, guys. Young people, give them another hand for hanging in here with us. God can do something good. I pray for us. God, thank you. I am so glad to be a part of a church that sees the next generation. I pray that every young person in this room today and any young person who ever comes into this building would know that they matter to God and that you would show us as individuals, as families, and as a church family, what does it look like? What, what does it look like for us to turn and to see this next generation and to help them to grow up in their faith Give us courage where we need courage. Give us patience where we need patience. And uh, we, trust, we trust you. You can do something good in us and through us for the benefit of others, especially this next generation. Help us to feel and know your presence and your peace today. Bless us, Lord. We want it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.